New Path Health is a provider of healthcare services with Canada's largest network of chronic pain clinics. The company is rapidly growing its cash flows through organic expansion, acquisitions, and business optimization. We've got CEO Joe Wallowitz here to tell us about the company's operations and plans for continued growth. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. It's Thursday, October the 24th. Please remember this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Joe, thank you for joining us today. How are things going? And please tell us about New Path. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, it's nice to be able to speak to all of you and, and give you an update on New Path. Uh, I'm Joe Wallowitz. I'm the CEO of New Path. I um, started here about two, two and a half years ago now as CEO, but I've been with the company really since its RTO, uh, since we uh, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange in 2020. So it's been four and a half years that I've been involved with the company and you know, seen some um, ups and downs, but you know, for the last two years, things have been going really well as we've been optimizing our clinics, um, you know, expanding our services and our uh, footprint as well. So let me talk to you a little bit about New Path. So first, before I start, we are publicly listed. So I, I, we do, I will make some forward looking statements. I encourage you to read our filings. All the details are there in our annual information form, as well as our annual financial results. We do use non-IFRS uh, measures, you know, things like adjusted EBITDA and adjusted um, operating, um, adjusted uh, gross margins, et cetera. So you can see details of that in our filings as well. So let me talk about a quick, give you a quick overview of New Path Health. We are Canada's largest provider of chronic pain management, as Martin mentioned. You know, if you look at our, our June um, results uh, that we announced in August, You'll see that our trailing uh, 12-month revenue is cl closing in on 70 million. We had almost 200,000 patient visits last year. We have 165 healthcare professionals uh, treating um, people within our clinics in Ontario and Alberta, and over 15,000 referring physicians who um, rely on us to take care of some of their patients when they're in need. So we're super excited about um, this strong platform that we built over uh, a number of years. So a couple of things I wanted to highlight, and, and just to, is there some mystique about what we do when we say we're in the medical clinics business? We are not a private medicine business. We are a private provider of public health. So when I say we're providing chronic pain management, we are providing that largely under the umbrella of OHIP or Alberta Health. Um, so we are really complementary to the system and not uh, you know, separate from the, the public system. Second, you know, I, do, I did say that we have a strong platform. The company has been, uh, you know, adjusted EBITDA positive for about 22 straight quarters, um, you know, and now our, our leadership is really, you know, making a lot of little under the hood operational improvements uh, just to, you know, optimize this business so we can deliver the care we need to patients. There's lots of opportunities for growth. I mean, I, I think the one thing I, I don't worry about is, is uh, you know, I don't have a customer problem, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully there'll be a day that won't be the case, but right now we have lots of people who need our help. And we're looking forward to welcoming them into our clinics. And so the way we uh, address uh, this growing population of uh, people suffering from chronic pain is by adding new locations, adding new physicians, adding new services. That's really what we want to do. But here specifically, I say, um, I talk about recent federal and provincial government initiatives. This is really kind of a global um, uh, issue is really kind of taking more work out of hospitals and putting it in the community. And I think we're really at the nexus of all that. Also, I will talk a little bit about our valuation. You know, we're currently at a EV of about uh, 12.6 million and uh, trailing 12 months, just at EBITDA about 3.6 million, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I, I have a, a constellation on the right to say that New Path Health operates under a number of brands. On our right side is about 90% of the business is, is really this our, our core clinics business, which is New Path Center for Pain and Spine, HealthPoint, HealthPoint at CAO, and in Medic. And um, on the left side, we have a, a number of non clinics businesses, which also help uh, accentuate our growth profile and uh, been contributing uh, to our growth in the last year. So I do have uh, this slide, which goes over a lot of different um, ways in which we, you know, a lot of different types of pain that we can treat. You know, we can treat patients, you know, for example, uh, you know, chronic headaches, uh, as in migraines, uh, degenerative disc disease, uh, you know, various uh, joint uh, injuries, sports injuries. So there's a lot of different neuropathic pain. So there are people who are getting treatments in our clinics, 
depending on which clinic you're in and which physician you're seeing, obviously it depends on what services you may or may not be able to be treated for. But I think the key thing I wanted to highlight here is that when you're getting treated for headaches in one of our clinics, uh, you're, you might get a Botox injection uh, to treat that migraine. If you have degenerative disc disease and you have lower back pain, you may get spinal uh, intervention, which involves putting radiofrequency ablation needles around uh, the spine. And with that, uh, with uh, neuropathic pain, you may end up getting an infusion of lidocaine. So what you heard come out of me is needle, needle, and needle. And I think that's really kind of what I wanted to highlight is that we're not really a clinics business so much as we run licensed healthcare facilities. Um, now, I do want to talk on the next slide about chronic pain uh, broad, more broadly. This is a, you know, a very large problem in Canada. It's costing us about 40 billion a year in Canada, you know, leading cause of uh, disability. But I also wanted to highlight too that chronic pain is in, in and of itself a disease. You know, we're helping to alleviate um, some serious problems that people are facing from underlying uh, issues. So obviously musculoskeletal pain, spinal injuries, uh, you know, sports injuries, concussions, these can all be drivers of chronic pain. And so when we say that we treat chronic pain, we're treating ultimately uh, something that's a resulting from something else. And so we view that not just chronic pain is our opportunity, but also many of these adjacent areas where we can even further help uh, patients recover from their, um, their experience. So looking at, you know, just our clinics business, which is the majority of what we do and our core focus uh, for the business over the last few years, um, we're in Ontario. We operate facilities in, from Ottawa to Windsor and most places in between. Um, you know, there's a few notable areas in Ontario that we're not yet, and so we certainly view those as opportunities. And then we look at uh, Alberta, you know, we're in Edmonton and Red Deer, uh, both Red Deer through a partnership with our, um, our partners at, at Central Alberta Orthopedics. So this is the um, kind of the coverage where we're at today. So when I say we're Canada's largest, we haven't even fully saturated Ontario. We're not in every market in Alberta, as you can see, and more importantly, you notice that we're not in every province. So we view there's a lot of opportunity, even in our core pain franchise, to expand, to be able to reach more patients and deliver uh, care in more locations. But more importantly, you know, so that, that's even over and above all the opportunities that I mentioned earlier in adjacent um, categories. So, you know, I, I do mention this often to investors that when we're talking about attracting positions, I mean, there is, uh, you know, a lot that goes into this. These are regulated facilities in Ontario, uh, the, uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario regularly inspects our facilities, has to approve the opening of our facilities. Um, you know, in Alberta, it's Alberta, uh, the Alberta College. So we do have these facilities are regularly uh, visited and uh, reviewed by the regulators. So it is a lot of work to do that. You know, we have about a thousand pages of uh, paperwork we have to submit when we have a new uh, clinic inspection. So these are, uh, we need to have crash carts, we need to have certain air quality. If we have a fluoroscopy suite, we need to have uh, lead shielding in the walls that provides um, you know, uh, protection for radiation. So there's a lot of that goes into this more than just a doctor's clinic. Uh, I, I kind of simply say to, to investors uh, frequently that you know, where you're sitting is a doctor's office if you were a doctor, but that cannot be a pain facility. And so that's the key is that there's, there's more to it. Um, new technologies and modern equipment, I mentioned briefly fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is a fancy word for real-time x-ray. And the reason you would do that is, I, as I say to people, is if you if your doctor is sticking a needle in and around your spine, you'd really like him to know where it is. And that's really the purpose of fluoroscopy. And so we've been expanding our fluoroscopy capacity um, and modern equipment. This costs a lot of money. We put uh, $600,000, built two fluoroscopy suites in um, in Red Deer, we built uh, two new floral suites in uh, Mississauga. We have a new one in Ottawa. We're looking at two other facilities where we're gonna be looking to drop lead in the walls and add uh, capacity there as well. So it is a, uh, a technology that is takes a lot of time and a lot of money to, to invest in. And so we think physicians will find that very attractive uh, being able to come to our facilities versus building it themselves. You know, third, we have a referral network. I, I, this picture on the right happens to be our HealthPoint clinic in Edmonton, which is our single largest location. But HealthPoint also, uh, the doctors that are rotating through U of A in the physiatry program also come through in, in our clinic as well. And so they get a chance to, to see what it's like to work outside of a hospital setting. 
And what they, they might notice is that we have 12 to 18 month waiting lists with a quality facility that would be the same as what they would see in a hospital. So we think that this referral network, if you graduate from med school and you've got a, a few debts uh, in your pocket or a few debts that you've got to deal with, uh, you know, we think that having that, that, that wait list uh, is, is very helpful for getting uh, physicians on board. Finally, you know, there's just the basics. So I always throw this last bullet is just kind of, yes, we, we, you know, hire staff. Yes, we deal with the landlord. Yes, we deal with the, all those other things. But I think the three other things are really critical as well. So as a package, I think it just comes together nicely. And we've had really good retention. We have over 100 physicians on our roster and we've had very limited turnover over the last three, four years. So it's a, it's been um, a good setup for them. And, I, and I'm happy that our partners see that that way. And we're always looking to improve. So in terms of growing this, I mean, for sure, there are many different ways. I talk about organic and inorganic growth. The company has been growing very well organically um, in terms of how do we do that? Well, when we increase capacity, pass uh, utilization of our clinics, you know, a few years ago, um, we were at 68%. This year, we're at 75%. Um, we onboard new doctors. And when I say new doctors, how do I uh, talk to my physician and say, can you add an extra day here? Can you... Uh, do you know anybody who should join us? You know, that's one way to uh, to grow the roster. Or through U of A, we recruited a new graduate this past year. Um, we can add new services. And so some of our clinics have been adding new services. Uh, for example, things like uh, PRP, which is plasma-rich protein injections, prolotherapy. Uh, both of those are, are not new therapies, but we're adding them in the clinic to make them more available to patients. Those are not covered by government uh, government payers. So for patients that are seeking something a little different, uh, we're able to offer that and, and that uh, helps us better use our facilities. And we also have some adjacent care people that help out in, in a number of our facilities. Finally, just working on, on productivity and throughput. How do you, you know, when, a, when you know, staff and physicians come in every day, you know, how do you make sure that you see as many people as you can without having downtime? And so that's that's scheduling, that's, uh, you know, um, having a good designed facility and a process to move people through. So it's uh, it's important in a, in a system where there's a shortage of doctors, throughput is a highly valuable thing for the entire uh, community uh, and for Bill, all. Yes. You mentioned adjacent care. Do you provide services like physiotherapy or massage therapy, uh, things like that? So we, we do that in a limited way. One, we have care providers that we're partnered with. So for example, in Edmonton, we are actually a 10% shareholder of a, a, a physiotherapy group that has two clinics and they work hand in hand with our team there. Um, in Ontario, um, a number of our clinics, I have one clinic where there's a massage therapist who comes in a few days a week. We have uh, some of our physicians and uh, one of our clinics who are doing uh, uh, sorry, acupuncture. So we are offering some of the adjacent care, but more importantly, most of our facilities are located, you know, co-located with pharmacies or with family practice clinics. Uh, so there, it's not quite, we haven't built the superstore model, but we are located in, in uh, facilities where people can get some of the key care uh, that they need uh, nearby without having to drive all the way out. So in terms of, I did say, you know, organically, so inorganic, well, organically on the expanding our network, one way we can do that is through Greenfield and new facilities. Um, we did build a new clinic in Red Deer um, a, a year and a half, two years ago. Now, I guess, uh, with, with, in partnership with a group called uh, Central Alberta Orthopedics, uh, that's an orthopedics group that wanted to do more uh, pain management. And so our Health Point group partnered with them to, to build that new facility, and, and that's been taking off. Uh, we are looking at new locations. I, I won't obviously talk about that <laughs> here today, but there are at least three new locations we're looking at for new Greenfield, new uh, new facilities to build out. Um, finally, just expanding in adjacent markets for sure. You know, if a patient has pain, they may require surgery. They may not be a candidate for surgery, in which case they may need pain care. We view orthopedics as a potential, you know, uh, adjacent area that we'd like to expand uh, into a little more. Um, and finally, just, you know, there's a lot of talk in the market, so I don't want to talk about too much other than to say that, you know, governments are looking to do more out of hospital surgery. A fluoroscopy suite with improved HEPA filtration uh, could easily be converted to a surgical suite should that be needed or desirable for us um, if we wanted to expand outside of that core pain place. I think for now we're waiting to see what the governments really want to do there before we go into that, but it's it's an opportunity for us potentially down the road. And just to bit reiterate there, this isn't uh, a private care or surgical suite model. This would be under the umbrella of government payment getting 
full, full support, they would pay you for whatever procedures, right? Correct. Yeah. The way we think about it is that if the government um, provides it, we can't provide it pri privately. You know, we when we provide care uh, that is not paid for, that is paid for out of pocket by their insurance company, it means that the government is making a decision not to pay for that. For example, with prolotherapy, the government or um, plasma rich protein injections, the government won't pay for that. There are some procedures that the government says, no, thank you, but patients, you know, need and, and can benefit from. And so we'll make that available, um, including, but in the surgical piece specifically, we would not, we're not doing private surgery. So in terms of uh, the financial overview, you know, we, we've had good revenue and adjusted EBITDA growth over the last few years. Um, you know, we're obviously six months into 2024 uh, now, but I think what's happened, what you've seen there is that you know, despite some changes, we've still had good growth on the top line. You know, we had the one acquisition in 2021, but even um, in a smaller one earlier this year. But if you look at that overall, it's been driven by physicians spending more time with us. And we've seen that in a lot of our clinics where, uh, where our, uh, you know, a physician leaves and then the revenues are up and it's because everyone else is, is adding more time. And so that's what we really want to do is create an environment where they want to be uh, and, and want to spend more time and give them the resources they need to, to be able to treat all the patients that they need. Um, we've been, but more importantly, we've been really working on this operational piece. You know, we believe this is a business that should be doing around eight to 10% margins, right? Uh, just on this current run rate. Um, you know, obviously if we had higher, you know, if we're hundred million plus, I think that margin can move higher. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is, is improve these margins so that we can invest in the growth, we can invest in the improvement of the facilities. You know, we spent a half a million dollars for six months this year on, on facility investments. You know, we we have a number of uh, clinic leases coming up next year. We have a number of greenfield opportunities. We'd like to build new clinics in certain locations. Um, so all of this, you know, improving our margins helps us to invest in all of that new equipment, new uh, new locations, new procedures. So, I mean, when I took over at the end of 22, the company was um, in, a, in a tough place, our cash balance had uh, decreased substantially from, we had raised money in 2020, um, to almost $12 million. And we were sitting there on one and a half million of cash. Um, we had almost 7 million in debt. And so our net debt was five and a half million. And as you can see that through uh, a number of things, through improving the profitability of the business, through improving capacity utilization and improves uh, looking at our facilities footprint, um, selling off one of our corporate owned facilities, beating the CRA, We've been able to fix this balance sheet and get it to a place where we're very pleased um, uh, with where we're at today. And so you can see that, you know, um, we had, through that period, just of one year, we had a 6% improvement in revenue, but 41% improvement in EBITDA. And you saw it early six months of this year, also single, high single digit uh, revenue growth and, and double digit EBITDA growth. So we think that that can continue for some time. And the reason is that we have a lot of facilities that the footprint of the company was built a long time ago. It was 10 years ago, actually, because all those leases are coming up this year and next. And so that's the focus right now on our operations team is how do we take some of these unused space, um, some of these facilities with uh, unused or poorly used space and reprioritize them. And so that's what we've been doing over the last 12 to 18 months. It's been a lot of heavy lifting and I know it's been um, some changes for, for the team, but overall, um, our facilities are busier now, we're better able to serve patients. And I think that's important. Um, you know, another way to look at it, I, I kind of, because we're a seasonal business, I, you know, for people to understand, you know, because patients come in to get treated by their physician, that means that when patients are off for Christmas or they're off for spring break or they're off for summer break, uh, they, uh, they're not in the, uh, they're not there. And so the doctors are also off on, on, uh, summer, spring break, uh, Christmas. So we do have some seasonalities. That's why I always like to look at the trailing 12 months. And so I'm just kind of keep this here. You can see that kind of progressive uh, improvements we've seen. Um, we've made a number of facility improvements this year. And so I'm hoping to see continued uh, improvements uh, for the next little while. Those are very sticky, those facility uh, changes because they, the uh, right sizing your real estate portfolio has a, has a, a long-term benefit to the business. So in terms of um, you know, myself personally, I, I gave a brief overview earlier. You know, I, as I said, I've been with the company longer than my tenure as CEO. I'm still on the board, uh, almost 30 years now in, in biopharma. You know, I've been at, uh, mostly on, in the healthcare space, mostly on the biopharma side. Uh, I was an executive at a number of publicly traded companies and on the board as well. Um, 
you know, my CFO, Jeff, uh, he was previously our controller from 2019. And when our uh, former CFO left, uh, Jeff agreed to step in and as interim basis. And we liked him so much, we asked him to stay. So he's been doing uh, a tremendous job in helping me, uh, you know, optimize all of the things that we've been trying to do while providing our staff and physicians all the support they need. We have three operations VPs who are uh, managing all the different brands uh, and, a, and a great team that's been running uh, some of these operations for a very long time. I, I won't talk too much about the board other than to say that we have um, some great uh, healthcare experience on here. You know, uh, from you know, Sasha runs healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare facilities business like us and also healthcare real estate. You know, Dan and Dan have both worked on, on drug development in the pain space. So we have lots of capital markets, uh, pain experience, and uh, medical clinics experience uh, as we look forward to what we need to succeed over the coming years. Um, on the slide, I just want to quickly, for investors, just to give you a quick flavor of what the share, um, the shares outstanding looks like. The company is relatively tightly held. And so when you look at the, the share structure, we have a Bloom Burton company who's our single biggest shareholder and John Burton is on our board. Um, you know, is 30, uh, 32%, uh, 34 on a fully diluted basis. Um, they are the biggest shareholder, but we also have uh, Claret Investment Management. Montreal is a 12% shareholder that's disclosed in the filings. And then we have a number of brokers who have rather large positions. So if you, I, I always joke with people, you can make five phone calls and talk to 80% of my shares. So we are closely held. We have a number of uh, big fans who've been supporting us uh, through throughout the, this uh, short and long term. So just in summary, to give you a, just that final thinking as you think about the path and where we're going, you know, this is a growing EBITDA positive business um, with a relatively clean balance sheet uh, that's cash positive, that's uh, looking to grow both expanding our locations and through looking at new facilities uh, and other clinics to acquire both within our key core markets of Alberta and Ontario, as well as uh, other provinces. Um, we spent a lot of money investing over the last two years, you know, in 22, 23, uh, and even in 24, we've been investing, um, whether it's uh, Edmonton, Red Deer, uh, London, uh, Mississauga, uh, and next year, Windsor, Oshawa, you know, that we're, and a number of other facilities that we're looking at, you know, uh, investing more dollars to make those clinics more modern, uh, to make them, uh, to add new technologies where appropriate. So it's those are gonna those are gonna start flowing through in future years, and so I'm very excited about uh, the care we're going to be better care we're going to be providing to patients and in nicer locations. Um, there's lots of opportunities for growth. I really, as I mentioned earlier, we we haven't even fully uh, dominated this uh, the pain space, but also we see a lot of adjacent opportunities. And then finally, we just think when I say the the federal and provincial government initiatives, what I'm really saying is that all the political discourse has really been around. How do we do less in the hospital and more in the community where patients are? And I think that that's what we see as well as being at the nexus of this out of hospital care, um, where we're providing kind of hospital like care in the community setting. We think that is just a global trend and we're glad to be at the center of that. So there's uh, in our deck, which we'll post on our, on our website, you see we have the EBITDA reconciliation to IFRS. And then that's the end there. So I don't know if you want me to stop sharing, Martin. Um, why don't we keep the, the, the deck up for now? I've got a couple questions and I have a feeling you may want to jump back to uh, some sure. slides to uh, highlight uh, that. One of the things that, that dawned on me while you were presenting, I was looking at businesses, the, the competitive landscape. And, and I guess you have competitors, let's say on two, for A, you, you're, you're, the customers have waiting lists. They're looking to go wherever that can take them. Um, and they're they're trying to find which clinic to go to, but you're also competing with sort of your your engine, uh, the doctors. You're trying to get doctors. There's a shortage of doctors uh, that everyone seems to be aware of. Um, can, like, and I, so who do you compete with? Like, I guess yeah. in terms of getting the doctors, are you trying to like sort of get them out of the hospital, get them out of med school, get them from their own clinics, get some from other pain management clinics, uh, just, and I, I guess it's fairly broad, but just talk about that whole dynamics of the, the doctors, how you get them, where they come from in that. Yeah, so, I mean, it really, it's a good question because um, everyone is facing a doctor shortage. And I think what the way uh, we view it is how do we be more efficient? You know, we're open on Saturdays, you know, which the procedures we do, so 
maybe I'll step back and say, the procedures we do are also done in, uh, in the public setting. You know, the UHN has a two-year wait list for their pain program. You know, the, the Root Center in McMaster has a long, lengthy wait list for their care as well. So this is the, the, the competition, which would be academic when, I, when you consider it uh, academic centers. Um, it would be independent centers. So, you know, although I did make a case that it is, you know, it is a, a complicated uh, thing to do to open up a new pain clinic and open up a new floral suite and to invest in all that. It's not impossible. So there are doctors and doctor groups that will set that up. So there are, there are a number of competitors to us. I, I think that, um, so when you, you, so we were talking about competitors in terms of who else offers the service. And so that would be the public system and a lot of independents, um, either independents or smaller chains, uh, you know, in, in Canada. Separately, there would uh, be, for a recruiting point of view, Yes, for sure. Pain specialists are uh, very short uh, in, in short supply. And so when we look at that, how do you uh, get patient, get doctors to spend time with you? I, I think the one thing I always say to people is that none of my, when I say I have 100 physicians on my roster, I don't have 100 doctors that come in nine to five, Monday to Friday. I have 100 physicians, you know, they might work one, two, three, four, five days a week. Um, it's like a normal distribution curve. So some will be I would say most are in that three days a week range. You know, they have other practices. They work in the hospital. They work, uh, they run a different clinic running, specializing in various uh, things that are of interest to them. Um, so from that perspective, you know, we're competing also not just with the system or other competitors. We're also competing with further time and their other interests too. So I, I guess from our perspective, how do we make it more attractive? It's, it's how do I make my facility environment better? How do I, when they come in, their schedule is full, that the, the staffing is all there to let them do, you know, see their patients that day. How do they, um, you know, the equipment they need that, uh, to get the job done. All these things that kind of the little subtle things that, you know, we always want to be better at that. And so doing that better and better will, um, it makes you more attractive. And so that's kind of, I think the, one of the reasons we've been able to keep a, you know, you know, relatively, like I said, a very low turnover at the business. Um, for the size that we are. And I'm very pleased with that, but I, I, I know we can do better. We continue to do better on that to, to really invest in the facilities um, and the technology to, to allow them to do that. And that's one thing I didn't mention earlier, but you know, certainly physicians across Canada, like we say, we're, you know, uh, there's a shortage of doctors. Well, doctors are also overburdened and you'll see that in the, in the news regularly. The doctors are overburdened with the paperwork that the system uh, uh, builds for them. So, uh, some of our competitors and, and ourselves are well, as well are looking at ways to uh, further optimize the, that process of, of all the paperwork that needs to happen. So uh, those kinds of things can get free up their time. If I, I was say, if I can get a doctor, if I can free up 30 minutes of their time, maybe they'll give me 15 and give 15 to their family, you know, and then everybody's happier, right? Uh, so that, that's kind of the way I look at it is how do we just be better at this so that um, the doctors are, uh, are able to provide uh, optimal amount of care and, and the time that they have allotted to us. You also mentioned one of the sort of a part of your network or the referring doctors. Could I just phone up one of your clinics and say, hey, I'd like an appointment for this? Or does it all get routed through uh, your GP or another doctor who refers you? Generally speaking, you need a GP to refer you into our clinics. You can't, you know, we do have some self-referral process, but you, you generally need a, a GP to refer you into the system. So yeah. that's, you know, so, and, and that's kind of different as well. Like, it's not like a walk-in clinic sort of uh, situation. You know, you have to get referred in and get triaged. Um, in Alberta, uh, physiotherapists can refer you into our, our facility, but generally speaking, you need a GP. The, like you were talking the fluoroscopy suites and that takes burden out of the hospitals. Do you pay for those out of your um, like procedure fees or do, do you get any sort of payments from the government to help buy that equipment or, or is that just sort of leases out of general operating uh, uh, revenues? Yeah, that comes out of general operating revenues. You know, we we don't uh, the government generally doesn't provide extra money for that. It depends. Yeah. Billing codes are quite different province to province. So there are some provinces where they recognize that imaging costs money, and so they give an extra uh, fee. But largely, the they uh, it's one of those things that we kind of have to eat, and so we view that as as kind of a recruiting tool or a, a you know by having that available. Because one of the challenges is that. Although the fluoro suites exist in, in major hospitals, 
uh, the flow of time is always limited. And that's one of the challenges a lot of doctors face is, you know, the, the ones that are doing fluoroscopic procedures, um, they, they have wait lists as well for them to get in and, and treat their patients. So it's, it's a, a wait list, a doctor wait list to use the equipment, right? So it's kind of a, you know, we're, by providing that in the community, it makes it easier for them to, uh, for the, that, I would talk about fluoroscopy, but there are other pieces of equipment as well by making that available. Uh, we can, uh, uh, it allows them to more easily access it and use it when they need it. And I guess that fits in with uh, the government's wanting to um, like uh, make things more efficient. It, when it's in a hospital, they pay the capital expense of the room and and that. Yeah. But if you're paying it out of your fees, they they're just paying the 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 patient fees and, and uh, the equipment appears. So they're not having to write the checks and manage that. So I, I guess that really aligns with their uh, initiatives. Well, they don't always think about it that way, but yes, the the, the procedure fees. Um, are the procedure fee, whether it's done in the hospital or in our in our uh, you know, facility, right? So it's it's kind of a, an interesting uh, observation that uh, that you have, but I don't know if all the governments see it that way. All right. Um, when you're e e opening new greenfield facilities, you you say you're looking at different locations, either greenfield or in partnerships and so forth. Um, there's lots of real estate out there. E when you're looking to do a new location. I, I guess you have two paths to go. You have to, okay, find the right facility, but then you can't open it and then try to find doctors to fill it. You kind of have to be doing that uh, uh, concurrently. That, that sounds, uh, I, I would guess that's a bit of a rate limiting factor getting those doctors on your side. Just talk about how you manage that green field with bringing the doctors on board and, and all that. It, you, you, you picked up on that pretty quickly. It is a bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? If I, it's the, uh, you know, it's not a field of dreams where we build a clinic and hope people show up. If we built a clinic, uh, a new one, it's usually an expectation that we already have doctors identified. And so the locations we're evaluating are specifically the locations where doctors have asked us, hey, if you build a clinic here, I would practice there, right? And so then that's where we can start having that partnership. And, and uh, the partnership with uh, Central Alberta Orthopedics is, is an example of that, where um, there were doctors available in the facility, um, wanted to do pain medicine. We, we decided to build that together. And so I think that if there are other situations like that, either uh, physicians who uh, may, you know, that pain may not be core to their practice, but they'd like to do a little more of it, you know, we can uh, invest or co-invest with them to build something new. And we're looking at models like that or a quote quasi competitor who would like to go into both of us agree that a third location might make sense and, and we get agree to work together to do that so you know we're looking at different models for that or just straight you know but, but generally speaking it's when, when there's doctors that are like hey we'd like to talk to you about building a new clinic here and that's kind of where we can get involved i think building it and hoping to show up is is, uh, is challenging for sure I'm thinking as well, like, uh, I think with the demographics, generally, we're all getting older as, as an average in the population and doctors are retiring and so forth. Th is that a challenge for you or maybe even an opportunity where a doctor wants to give up their full practice, but then they could maybe slide into you and just do one or two days a week with you and, or is there a, a bit of both uh, in that? Yeah, really. Well, so I, I'm just, as you're talking, I'm just trying to, uh, mentally go through my list of, uh, you know, the, the physicians or physician partners and thinking about who are on that different stage of their career. I would say that most of our physicians are probably kind of mid career. Um, okay. You know, there's not a lot of, we have a few newer ones and a few, I think of one maybe that I can think of that's kind of more in that retirement said, oh, well, maybe I'll do pain one day a week kind of thing. There aren't that many of those. I haven't seen that um, okay. as much. Switching uh, more to the financials of your business, I, I noticed uh, in one of your graphs, it looked like in, I believe in 2022, your margins dipped uh, a little bit. And uh, I'm just curious what happened there, what caused that sort of uh, down dip? Yeah, so I, I think after we went public, there was, uh, you know, it was the middle of COVID, right? It was uh, 2020, 2021. And there was definitely a lot of talk about telemedicine and doing more a remote, um, doing more remotely with, with patients. And so we obviously were looking at that uh, very clearly as well. And so that led us down uh, some software development paths. So I think a big part of 
at that time, we had been working on some software and some marketing in support of that software uh, development path that really impacted margins. I mean, there was also some underlying deterioration in the clinics business um, that were that was not being addressed. But I think at the end of the day, there was also the biggest driver of that was the it was the expense related to software development and, and new software uh, that we were uh, looking at developing. And so we shelved that program just, you know, based on the, the cash flow piece uh, that we were facing in the in the uh, the debt situation and the cash flow situation that we had in 22 is when we shelved that program. You know, is there there may be a future where that we look at that again, but I think that we'll have to see what the competitive environment, you know, it's the buy versus build. Uh, and we were doing we were building it when it, you know, it may be. The next time we revisit that, we'll be looking at the, the, the buy scenario. So we'll, we'll look at both. But I think for now that that, that was really the, the core clinics operations were not generating enough cash to support a large software development program. Okay. All right. That makes sense. You're, you're more focused now. Um, your debt levels have declined uh, dramatically. And I believe looking at your last one of the slides there, you're at less, the debt is less than one times EBITDA, which is a very uh your net debt it was very modest and one yeah. could argue maybe it's even too low um like are are you like i presume you're not going to start issuing a, a dividend here soon you've got growth plans what would and and you're you're sort of you're waiting for the right growth opportunities either acquisition or green fields and 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 so forth but i guess what is sort of optimal debt levels what how do you ex expect to use excess cash that you have on the the balance sheet well, for now, as you can see that year to date, our cash balance um, at year end and our cash balance at June haven't really changed because of some investments we've been making. You know, we last August, we opened a new clinic in London, Ontario. Uh, this year, we invested in our Mississauga relocation, um, which uh, just to point out that one, we spent almost you know a couple hundred thousand on that before landlord uh, uh, inducements. And that took our Mississauga and head office from 17,000 to 6,000 square feet. So we dropped 11,000 square feet effective August 1, on, but we had to invest the cash uh, to get that ready. And so in terms of what's the optimal debt cash level, I think that until last August, you know, when we sold our facility, our net debt was still not there, right? So we still had that, um, we had a $1.2 million mortgage. We sold the facility for a little over two. Um, so when we realized that last, uh, basically September 1 of last year, that was really when the, the balance sheet kind of, you know, flipped, right? We had um, a win against the CRA last May, um, a year and a half ago, sorry, we did a small debenture financing and the combination of the debenture financing, the building sale and the, the, um, and the, the CRA win in combined with the uh, the continuing cash flows of the operations have allowed us to kind of, um, you know, kind of get into a better place here. You know, you, you ask a lot of pieces to that question. So I'll maybe talk about optimal debt levels. Well, for sure, you know, if we're not, we would love to be in a position where we had, um, you know, more of an acquisition line with the banks. You know, that would be helpful as we look at some of these new opportunities. Uh, for Greenfields, we have the cash on the balance sheet. You know, if, if I tell you that building a new site will cost me, you know, six to $900,000, you know, I've got, 3 million on the balance sheet, so I can do a couple of those. So we, we've been assessing right now what the right strategy is for the balance sheet. And I think you'll probably just have to stay tuned, but I think that the, for sure, sitting on, you know, 3 million cash and 6 million in debt isn't the right structure in all these buckets. So we also do have to pay off our debentures next April. So that's coming up. So we just, you know, that may lead to a slightly higher cash balance uh, than we would normally run. So as we restructure all these debt instruments that we have, we only have 900,000 of bank debt right now. And I think our goal would be to kind of think about how do we uh, take the multiple buckets and create kind of a, you know, you have your operating line and you have your acquisition line. And I think that would be ultimately the goal for us is to kind of uh, build that up. You talked about raising your margins and and you've also talked about your 10-year leases are are coming up and you've optimized that going from, what, I think, 17,000 to 9,000 or, or on, on those uh, facilities. So I'm, I'm guessing you're paying less uh rent on that and again i'm throwing out all sorts of stuff what, what i guess i'm trying to get to is like how much more optimization and and margin expansion can you get um from your operations here so i mean look 
I think that stepping back so investors understand that, and you know, even em employees uh, or anybody or any of our other stakeholders understand, we had 93,000 square feet of real estate, of which a large chunk of that wasn't being used. You know, we had, um, when I joined, we had a 15,000 square foot lease in, uh, in one of our locations that as of today, we're only using half of that, right? So that's seven and a half thousand square feet at 30, uh, 30 bucks a square foot, you know, ball parking it. So you can see that that's there. On Mississauga, we had 17,000, now we're using six. We're doing the exact same thing. In fact, we have a much nicer, newer facility and uh, a nicer head office, even though we're paying less in rent and, and um, uh, you know, on that. All of those are just happening now. And so you can see in our filings that we have all the leases coming up in, in 24, 25, and 26. You know, a lot, we have um, a few locations coming up next year. And of course, we're looking at the sizing of those. I think from a, uh, the actual, like we closed at the end of last year, we closed Toronto and we relocated those physicians to Scarborough, Mississauga, uh, and one to Hamilton. You know, when we do those, we're, you know, the patients and the doctors will get moved around so that we're improving our uh, facilities. Uh, so that's why you're seeing that uh, the capacity utilization numbers uh, going up over time, like from 68% last year to 75% Q2. It's just better using the space. So we're just trying to look at that. So I, I think if you look at all the leases coming up and what we're doing, you're probably going to see about a 30% a, a decline in our real estate footprint over the next two years without changing uh, the amount of providers we have or the number of, uh, amount of care we're providing. So it's it's really, um, you know, it's it's really, it's not so much a McKinsey analysis, you know, some, we've got some consultants in to figure out how to do this. It's just that all these leases that existed with a former entity that were uh, left uh, upon uh, the predecessor new path, um, all those leases are expiring now and we get to re reload. And so one people question, people always ask me, are you getting lower le lease rates? Lease rates? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, there's all this competition. Landlords are fighting over uh, tenants. It's not so much that as what the landlords seem to be really helping us to do is refurbish and uh, improve our facilities. So our, you know, our Mississauga clinic, for example, was probably our oldest and um, I'm trying to be diplomatic, um, our oldest and most uh, rundown facility. Um, and now, now our new Mississauga clinic is, you know, as I said, it went from, you know, we went from 17,000 to, uh, to 6,000 in Mississauga right now. And we have a more, uh, same amount of treatment rooms and a much more beautiful site. And the, and the landlord did fund a good chunk of that. So I think that's what we're seeing is that our, our opportunity is not so much to um, save money on rent, like as in a per, per square foot, is how do we optimize our facilities and use the landlords to make them better so that our patients, our uh, staff and their physicians all enjoy a better experience. Okay. But the, the short end is your, your cost or your real estate costs are going down. Yeah. And so when you look at our numbers, you'll see that our, our you know, just an EBITDA or EBITDA, you see the real estate number in there. It's big. It's a big number. 90,000 square yeah. foot is a lot of rent, right? And so yeah. when you get from 90,000 to 60,000 over a three-year period, you're going to see that uh, those rent numbers are going to come through. And so that's why I always say to people, I go, look, you know, all those things we're doing, we haven't done yet. Like some of those are still, um, when we see, we're start, uh, you know, future quarters to start seeing continued improvements there. But I don't think there's any plans now to, you know, we did close Toronto um, at the December. There's no plans for any of the facilities to, to close. We're looking at locations, maybe in one or two instances, but for the most part, we've done the optimization right now that we need to do. And we're very happy with where we're at for most of the facilities. So now it might be uh, a sprucing up or a, or, or a uh, refurbishing a little bit some of the facilities, but I think we're in, great, we're in a great spot right now. I'm mean, just quickly, I don't know, quite competitors, but comparables as a public company. Um, we don't have a chart here, but you're one could make an argument, I think, fairly easily that you're kind of cheap here on uh, on metrics compared to your competitors. Uh, do you have any sort of comments or uh, things you'd like to speak to that? Yeah, sorry, I don't have an updated uh, comps table there. And, it, and it's hard because we don't really have a, a good comp set, you know, for uh, publicly traded uh, medical clinics business. But I think, it, you know, what I would point you to is like our market caps, maybe at 9.6 million now, and as you noted, 3 million in net debt versus our trailing 12 months adjusted EBITDA was 3.6 million. So at 12.6, 
uh, divided by 3.6, you know, you're a little over three times on the adjusted uh, multiple of adjusted EBITDA. And this is for a business that's growing, right? Like our, our organic growth is there. Um, the inorganic growth opportunities are there. Um, we think it's uh, it's a great opportunity for, for people who are looking to uh, look in a, a large, stable, growing business uh, with multiple opportunities to expand. Can you just talk about the type of news flow uh, investors uh, should keep their eyes open for? Sure. Yeah. No. For I mean, I you know, I mean, we're revenue positive and profitable, so we'll be reporting results as we mentioned on November fourteenth, and so that'll be the next thing there. But I think in terms of you know looking at these, you you can never predict the new business opportunities, but for sure um, we have both new uh, new greenfield opportunities as well as uh, obviously other uh, groups that we'd like to invest in, and so we just keep an eye out for that. I think as we look at next year, for sure. You know, we keep tinkering under the hood to make this more efficient more and more profitable as we try and work towards that 8 to 10%. We um, definitely keep an eye out for, for new opportunities, uh, new growth opportunities over the next 12 months. All right. Well, with that, Joe, thank you very much for uh, taking the time and uh, giving us uh, an introduction and uh, an explainer on uh, New Path Health. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Martin.